So as I mentioned this earlier, we've got Kevin Lloyd, who is a practice director at Hassel's Brisbane Studio, with a particular focus on design and management. Kevin has worked for over 25 years in London. Kevin joined the Brisbane office of Hassel in 2015 and brings a depth of experience across a range of sectors, including education, research, retail, commercial and hospitality. He's an award-winning architect for his work both in the UK and internationally. The results of, in designs which are richer in their context and influence and are connected to the city. Um, his interests lie in the wider role of buildings, what the wider role of buildings play in defining our cities, the importance of context, engaging with people who experience them and the communities they serve. Our second speaker or joint speaker is Adam Davies, also a principal from Hassels in Brisbane. He's an urban planner and a designer with specialties in health, higher education and science sectors. He successfully led large-scale master planning project, urban design studies, visioning and briefing processes. Um, he is the master plan lead for the Hurston Quarter, obviously was why he's here today. Um, his recent commissions include master planning projects at Monash University in Kuala Lumpur, Parkville in Melbourne, the University of Newcastle, the University of Wollongong and the University of New South Wales. Adam's held the senior positions in the United Kingdom at the office of the Deputy Prime Minister, the Commission for the Architect and the Built Environment, and was the Head of the Enabling at Architecture and Design in Scotland during its formative years. Please welcome Adam and Kevin. Thank you very much, and uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for the uh, kind invite for um, allowing us, myself and Adam, to come and talk to you today about the work we've been doing on the Hurston Quarter, and actually the journey that we've been on for quite a number of years, and both myself and, and Adam. Um, and we're going to give you a summary of the master plan, uh, the work we've been doing in terms of some of the buildings that are coming forward, and the interface with the public realm, which is obviously a significant portion of the work that we've been doing and also about the thinking and our approach to the site. Um, it's been a great project. It's been a fantastic opportunity to revitalise what is a significant part of the city. And it's about being a partnership as well, um, a partnership with our client, Australian Unity, which is uh, represented here by Nathan Anderson from Avanor, um, and also their partners, uh, Metro North, and the team that we've been working with, and not only myself and Adam, but the other people back in our office uh, in Brisbane, and, but also the wider consultant team as well, and including Wattpack as well, our contractor. So I'm going to hand over to Adam. He's going to take you through the initial piece of work on the master plan, and then I'll, he's going to hand back to me a little bit later, and then we'll talk a bit about the buildings. Thanks, Kevin. Um, thanks very much for the invitation to be here today. It's certainly um, a great project and um, something, I think, worthy of... Um, the time that's been dedicated to this session, so um, thank you for that. Um, I'm really the entree to the main course today, and um, a lot about what I'm going to talk about is the positioning of health precincts and how they're changing, and I guess what were some of the drivers that led to the decision to embark on a project such as Hurston Quarter, and then how it unpacks on the site, and um, Kevin will then, Con will then unpack the detail going forward. Um, my brother works on the precinct, so um, there's, a, there's a bit of a connection there. He's a, he's a neonatologist um, a consulting in the Royal Women's Component. So he looks after extremely sick, premature babies. And um, his role on that precinct is really quite complex. And un kind of understanding what he does kind of unpacks the kind of way that these precincts operate, but also the changes that are inherent in the years to come. So he looks after extremely sick, um, premature babies. Part of that role is um, to do retrievals um, through the state. So he supports a wider health network that doesn't have the capacity and doesn't have neonatal intensive care units. So often finds himself travelling on uh, light aircraft and, and helicopters at weird times of the day. But he also has a higher education responsibility. And we know that there's presence on the campus from UQ and um, Queensland University of Technology. So he has to do the, the lecturing and so on, and he does his associate professor role um, with the University of Queensland. But as part of his position within Queensland Health, he has a 30% research load. 
So there's an expectation that he's going to undertake ongoing research throughout his career and publish, bring in research funding and so on. His, um, his PhD, which he did many years ago, I don't know how many of you remember the movie The Abyss, it, uh, it was released in the late 80s. Um, but in that movie, they sent down deep divers um, using um, liquid, oxygenated liquid, essentially to assist them breathing at, um, at great deaths, apparently. But his research was looking into... That's actually on here, so I'm not sure what the problem is. Um, but his research was looking at um, how do they use oxy oxygenated liquids to ventilate neonates um, because it, it has, a, has a more gentle approach for um, the development of the young in premature at that time. So he has an interesting position on the precinct and with that comes a desire to have a number of things. So he needs to have access to his clinical spaces, of course, research, um, laboratory and other spaces that go with it. So I think one of, the, one of the first places for start is just to have a look at, um, sorry, it's just a problem with the, with the screen and the kind of, okay, take two. Um, I think it's important to kind of consider what influences change on these precincts and um, some of the things that have, I guess, resulted in some of the health precincts that we see today. And um, Kevin will certainly unpack um, some of the kind of, the key observations on the precinct um, in his part. But the important thing about these precincts, of course, is the, where you get that kind of, that joint health education and research components. And it's that special little bit in the middle that, that creates that innovation and collaboration spot. And um, the need, the very strong need to have all of those kind of, those various players on the precinct at any given time. But I think one of the other things that's influencing change in relation to these precincts is just the evolving model of care in relation to health. And um, certainly we're moving to a model that's looking at um, more preventative um, measures these days, but also being very clear about how we're distri distributing the various level of care amongst the elements. And I think part of this process was looking to find the right spot um, for the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital into the future, where it provides those, um, those very acute services um, to a very large population. But on the flip side, there's that need to start consideration in respect of how these precincts evolve as urban places in their own right. Um, they've often been perceived very much as um, very specialist enclaves that have refused to let the city in. And it's time, I think, that we start to arrest um, some of those problems that we've seen with these precincts for some time. So some of the things that influence design decisions on health precincts, there is, of course, the clinical imperative. And none of us can ask around that can, can I guess, challenge the need to have it the very best and highest level of care on our health precincts. But I guess one of the things that we've asked is, does that necessarily have to come with a kind of clinical imperative architectural and urban design response as well? And can we start mixing that up and creating people, creating places that people can also use, not just those um, that are very clinical in respect of how people, and we deal with wellness. They have very large, diverse populations. As we know, there's all of the highly specialised talent that occupy, but there's a range of other people, patients, um, family, staff, um, and a range of different people who are employed on the precinct. And of course, there's this small little matter of attraction and retention as we move forward. How do precincts of this nature, operating in a global environment, attract the people that they need to in the years to come? <coughs> It was Charles Landry um, a few years ago who made the observation that the way that people make decisions about where they wish to live and work changed. Somewhere in the order of 20 years ago, people made um, job locations first. So where can I get work? I'm, I'm happy to move to get work where it's needed. These days the pendulum has swung and people are much more recognising the role of regional, city and locational benefit and lifestyle in respect to where they are seeking um, employment. We, um, we did some research at Hassel a few years um, and we've, we've had a rolling program of research in relation to the health sector for some time. But we did some um, research in relation to what's driving um, attraction and retention, particularly for nurses. And it was interesting to find in that um, the current shortages, but also the projected shortages. And once again, this thing about we really have to think very hard about the, the precincts that we're designing and the facilities that we're designing to start arresting some of these huge numbers 
um, not just in Australia, but a global problem these days. Equally important, I think, is competition. Um, we've just had two extremely large hospitals open, one on the Gold Coast, one on the Sunshine Coast, both about 750 beds. A clinician now with a research load and an education um, requirement in the years to come will be able to make a decision as to whether they wish to live on the Gold and Sunshine Coast and do everything they can on the Royal Brisbane Hospital, the Hurston Precinct, or the Princess Alexandra Precinct. So they're competing. All of these health precincts compete for talent. And you've got to ask a question about the lifestyle factors when you're able to, um, to spend the morning surfing or doing whatever else on the beach, and then being able to work in, in close um, proximity um, to a university, university hospital. That's going to, um, to tick all those boxes for you. The um, Metro North did a little bit of research before they started the process um, with Queensland Treasury and um, they identified that there are a number of kind of success factors that really high performing precincts of this nature needed to have. Um, so some of those were proximity and transport related, others were the type of infrastructure that was on the precinct but also what was supporting. And it was interesting that um, Metro North found that there were only three of those char characteristics um, that were evident or in close proximity um, to the precinct. So part of this project and part of what they wanted out of it was to start arresting those gaps and how can they start weaving or shaping the precinct into a high performing global precinct in the years to come. We all know where it's located and um, some of that brilliant work with the Smart <coughs> Cities Council um, many years ago where it identified the, um, the, the kind of the knowledge cluster that's important to Brisbane but it also sits in a fairly dynamic part of the world that's undergoing significant change. And I think it was Kelvin Grove Urban Village um, many years ago that started to lay the foundations for a mixed-use village, um, bringing together education, um, you know, residential, retail, as well as um, other uses, research, research interests in the precinct these days. And then, of course, you've got the activity that's on the RNA precinct um, being delivered by Lend Lease. It's well connected, it's, it's well positioned, it's everything that you would want in a precinct of this nature. Surprisingly, there's somewhere in the order of 15,000 people that call the precinct home on a daily basis. That's a huge population. It's the size of Dolby getting up towards Gympie. You know, you're flat out at the moment um, getting anything on the precinct other than um, something from the news agents and flowers getting a script filled or a rather dodgy meal served out of a Bain Marie. Perhaps it's time to start thinking about the offer on these precincts and how we can change that in the years to come. Um, the Hurston Quarter itself, it's, um, hopefully you're able to see it, it's um, contained within the, the orange dash line. Um, it's about five and a half hectares in total. Um, the balance of the precinct then lies at about 14 and a half. So it's a sizable piece of the former Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital complex and particularly where the um, former Royal Children's Hospital used to sit on the frontage of Hurston Road. <coughs> Um, once again, it's got those diversity of uses across health um, research. QIMR has somewhere in the order of 12,000 researchers across the three buildings at the moment. And of course, you've got the University of Queensland and QUT on the campus. Our journey's been quite a long one. It kind of started in 2010, and this is how long these projects take to evolve. Um, we were fortunate in 2010 to start a process with the then Department of um, Employment, Economic Development and Innovation. Um, we did a what was termed a smart community plan for the precinct. It was really um, the first master plan, but importantly the first master plan for a health precinct that looked at it from a core principle master planning perspective rather than starting, I guess, from a clinical, a clinical master plan. And it really asked the question about how we're going to work together and what sort of place do we want in the future. Um, that then rolled through various studies. There was a study that looked at the, um, at the uh, work of a statewide pathology centre and, and its ongoing role in the precinct. Um, then there was, of course, the business case and feasibility process for both the master plan, but also back then um, the planned procedure centre. The, um, the Hurston Quarter RO request um, or registration of interest process started in 2014 and then there are numbers number of stages that evolved for that. There was the expression of interest stage, um, there was a request for, pro for proposal stage, Stockland, Lend Lease and um, Australand slash Fraser's were shortlisted for that. Um, shortly after that, um, Australian Unity took over as the lead proponent for the bid um, from Fraser's. 
There was then a best and final offer process towards um, the end of 2016, and it was just in February in 2017 um, that contractual close um, was announced for the precinct. The government wanted to see a number of things being delivered. Um, it, was, it was a fairly um, underutilised precinct. It had a lot of um, poor performing assets. From their perspective, it needed to work out what it was going to do with the former Royal Children's Hospital site. But there was a whole heap, as we said, place and service aspects that they wanted to solve. Three of the important ones, I think, was the delivery of a specialist rehabilitation and ambulatory care centre. So this, once again, getting back to that model of care, it was seeking to drag out a whole heap of elective surgery um, from the main hospital and place it into the new centre. Um, and then there was a very um, specialised rehabilitation unit. Since then, there's been a couple of other partners who, who's come into that first facility um, from a rehabilitation and also the University of Queensland um, will take a floor um, within that facility. It will be the first thing um, delivered. Um, it's being um, funded, designed and um, maintained by Australian Unity and Partners. Metro North will come in and run the service out of the facility. Um, so a, a strong partnership going forward. The other couple of critical things was, was actually having a good look at the heritage buildings that sit at the core of the precinct. And um, some of those buildings have, have laid um, derelict for somewhere in the order of 20 years. So um, there's a serious state of neglect and disrepair in some of those. They've um, had new roofs um, put on since the storm of uh, 2015 or 14, I think. But um, generally wonderful assets, but really needing some love and attention going forward. And the other critical one there, and certainly one of the components of the early stage works, is the um, there's a there's a um, a fair amount of um, hospital services that run through the Hurston Quarter that have to be relocated from the central energy unit. So you've got oxygen, um, data and, and, and fibre and chilled water. That's um, currently going through final engineering design so that can be re relocated. So a really important um, start to the process. I think one of the, the, the kind of strong conceptual ideas behind the precinct was this this idea about how do we start viewing this as a component of the city rather than, um, once again, a, a very specialist enclave. And there's no doubt that the site um, that sits on Hurston Road and then um, up to the Heritage Core and down, down the old gully side of the, um, the hospital precinct was very much how you think about stitching that back in and what might happen on Hurston Road that is addressing the city and forming a very, I guess, civic and formal part of the, of the precinct up to the, the, the beautiful and kind of inherent structure of the heritage core. And then is there a more domestic and, and, and relation and stronger relationship with the community of Hurston that's often forgotten? But I think one of the really key things about the project was how do we actually start inviting the community into the precinct and having it as a usable asset for them to enjoy as well? Um, I'll just run through the various uses that um, have been proposed. Um, the, Specialist Rehabilitation and Ambulatory Care Centre um, sits on the, the um, northeastern corner and it, it connects back into um, the Queensland Institute of Medical Resources. Um, there's a, a proposal for a future residential um, tower. There is um, continuing studies underway for what might be a site for a private hospital. The Heritage Call will be used for a range of temporary accommodation, most likely. Um, investigations are ongoing, but it's a possibility that um, student accommodation might occupy um, the for former um, Dodds Lady Lamington building, but it's also the two Spanish towers. There might be a range of community uses. One of the expectations of government that the childcare um, be re 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 relocated will go into the bottom of the um, Edith Cabal. Um, there's an opportunity to get a second childcare for the precinct at the bottom of what is a, an aged care um, building, a number of um, retirement um, living units, and then a new car parking um, structure aligned um, in the northern area of the precinct and very much um, positioned to, I guess, welcome what is the general hospital's position of where it's advancing um, clinical core will be. Um, that's kind of the balance of the uses. One of the intents, certainly, of the process that the government started was to make sure that, that this was complementary and that there was health and biomedical um, facilities being delivered. 
And I think um, you know the strength of the offer in relation to delivering, being able to deliver the SHRAC with a private hospital, um, but also um, some thinking about ageing populations, how we deal with the retirement and um, aged care, so there's a, certainly a high proportion. But then starting to mix that precinct up, the residential uses, um, as well as community, social, retail, um, food and beverage and so on. One of the key things um, that we're acutely aware is that um, the Hurston Quarter really needed to stitch the precinct back together and one of the underlining, I guess, drivers behind, behind the master plan was very much about connecting into what is the skywalk system of the hospital. Once you get up to level six um, on the precinct, most of the population knows that that's the level in which one inhabits the precinct. Um, you know, as, as an urban designer, you look at that and think, geez, I'd love to get people down to the ground, but it is a necessary component of the hospital. So I guess we've been fighting to do two things. Allow it to integrate into a known system within the hospital, but also work very hard about how we can start dropping people down to the ground, start occupying the edges and, and the public realm within the precinct. And then there's a, a, an urban design framework that, um, that sits behind that. But I'll now hand over to Kevin, who will uh, take you through the detail of the master plan and facilities. Thank you. Thanks, Emma. There's technology to our Thanks so much, Adam. Uh, I'd like to now take you through um, some of the thinking behind the actual uh, uh, more sort of in-depth evaluation of the master plan itself. And I guess one of the key things that we kind of recognised is that when you deal with these sorts of projects, the challenges that you face in terms of trying to realise the opportunity, and that opportunity is really about creating a precinct that you know is not both diverse in its offer, but but also authentic. And and how do you achieve those? but still deliver value for your client. And within this framework of, of, of buildings, uh, both new and existing, there were a number of challenges. But behind this, we just felt that it was really an imperative that this precinct really needed to sort of foster the intrinsic qualities that we thought were important in defining a sense of place, encouraging diversity and providing a sense of livability, and actually making a piece of city making um, which is very closely aligned with the neighbouring Hurston community, which uh, Adam alluded to before. So we set ourselves a number of objectives, and these were things that we felt were important that needed to be embedded into the scheme in some way. And the first one was that we thought it needed to be inclusive. So it needed to be a place that blurred the boundaries between what is private space, what is invited space, and of course what is public space, which is quite unusual for a health precinct in some respects. We also felt it needed to be community focused, it needed to engage with the local community, both, both at the local level and the wider city level. It needed to be connected, it needed to put basically connectivity, both pedestrian connectivity and connection to the existing transport infrastructure at its heart. And it needed to be characterful and responsible and responsive to its environment with a range of scales which respond to the needs of the neighbourhood, adjoining buildings and properties and spaces. And it also needed to be diverse in terms of its programme and flexible. This is a master plan for the next 20, 30 years. And as you can see from what Adam was describing, there's still a lot of evolution going through in the thinking of the types of uses that are coming into future buildings. But it also needs to be memorable. It needs to add value to the urban landscape reinforce the unique character of Brisbane and the culture of the city, and defining a sense of place that encourages diversity, and creating spaces that we regard as being places that people actually enjoy and love. So, at the outset, we um, began looking, as Adam did in terms of health um, models, we also looked at good master plan exemplars. Um, and King's Cross Regeneration, the one that I know very well, having spent some time working on the project, was something that we felt did certainly had resonated with us very strongly with the work looking at in Hurston. And what it showed is that through a true partnership and long-term vision, it was possible to actually deliver exceptional high-quality value buildings in public space. 
And other than health, this was, a, this was a site that had its origins in, as you can see, pretty heavy rail engineering, picture of uh, the construction of the Circle Line, I think, in the mid-1800s. Um, and a significant piece of land that sit behind the rail, rail infrastructure, some 27 hectares of land, was effectively derelict former industrial buildings that by the 70s and into the late 80s had become a sort of no-go area for um, many Londoners, except if you were kind of a young student looking for a good night out in some of the nightclubs. But um, it presented a huge challenge, but also a problem about how do you solve such a complex issue with a range of over 20 listed buildings, huge opportunity in terms of value of space, and these incredible connections back to transport infrastructure. And it began with a partnership, and the partnership was actually led by the local authority through government, and it then transferred to Argent as a developer who took a real long-term interest in the site. And the interesting thing is, is that the first piece of the site that actually began to happen and got regenerated was this little piece in here. Nothing else happened until that started. And that's a heritage building. That's a that's a, an old <coughs> railway goods shed that had sat derelict for a number of years. No one could find any uses for it at all. And a university edu education facility came along and actually took it on board. And that became the catalyst for change. And interestingly enough, what Argent did is that they began to regenerate that building and invested very heavily at the front end in public realm. And the quality of the public realm lifted the whole spirit of the place. And it became a destination before anything else had happened. So to get to this space, which is, as you can see, pretty busy and pretty active, you actually walk between two hoardings, the building sites either side, back down to King's Cross Station. But people actually took advantage of it, they made it their own, and they began to make it a place that became an integral part of the city. So by 2020, when the whole scheme is built out, the population here, 40,000, which interesting enough compared to our 15,000 is only sort of two and a half times the amount. So there's an interesting parallels in terms of scale. The site is about three, four times the size of the overall precinct for uh, the hospital. Um, but it certainly has some resonances with the elements that we thought in terms of how you deal with proactively with heritage buildings and how you also you think about a curated retail offer that adds to the experience using not only mainstream retailers, but also independent retailers. This is actually one of the first retailers that came into one of the spaces here that really generated an interest and excitement about the place. And of course, active public realm, used by the community. This is the university building, a whole bunch of kids playing out as they do every summer's day, warm summer's day in England, where in the end they begin to actually enjoy this space and make it their own. And then a whole series of new spaces that sit around new buildings sitting with existing heritage buildings. And the new buildings, and interesting, since a social housing building, hard to believe, isn't it, the quality of that building. It's, um, but it, this is one of the very first buildings that was erected on the site. The reason I included it is that it resonates very closely with the heritage of the place. So new buildings, <coughs> although they are distinctly new in their character and the form, had a strong resonation back to the historic character of the king's... Uh, King's Cross Goods Yard, the buildings that sat on the site, and we felt these were important pieces that we should bring through to the work that we were doing at Hurst. And so what did we learn? Well, we found there were some similarities. Significant land holding just on the edge of the city, very close to the city's CPD. <coughs> Number of historic buildings that were laid dormant in the heart of the site, and also poorly connected to a very closely associated existing community. Very little permeability. So we did what we do with all our jobs, and we went back in time a little bit, and we began to think about what is the future proposition for a new master plan at Hurston, and in order to do that, we needed to understand the historic context of the site. This wonderful picture from the late 1800s, this is when people would go to hospital to actually escape the small city town as it was in those days, moving out into the country, because actually you know, it was good. It was good to be in the country because it was actually healthy. Uh, so people moved out. It's, this is the emergence of the hospital, small-scale buildings. And this is a picture here, the General Hospital from the late 1800s, very domestic in their scale and character. And as Brisbane began to grow, so did the hospital itself in relating back to the emerging population. And as you can see here by 1934, um, on the top of the hill, hill here is the Lamington buildings, which I'll come back to later. Um, the hospital had grown quite significantly. 
and quite an interesting collection of buildings of different types of scale, some very much of the sort of still quite local domestic vernacular, the Queensland or the Verandas. But of course, the emergence, as you can see up here, of a sort of new intermediate scale of building, uh, which again is responding to the new demands of intensity of hospitals and, of course, uh, the population and, and the demands of that. But interestingly enough, they still had a generosity of space. This is the base of the Lamington Towers. And they also had a certain quality to them. There were buildings that had a civic nature. And the whole kind of the idea of creating buildings that had the civic quality, we again thought was very important in the work that we're doing. And then everything changed. The 1970s, different attitudes, different thoughts about how architecture and buildings should be. Actually, I quite like this building. It's not a bad building. Um, but um, it's really kind of what <coughs> happened after this that became the issue. And this was really how buildings became containers that really reacted to the demand and the demand for intensity on our hospital precincts. And the next image, oops, maybe, if I push it on the button, that one. Not unusual, actually. This could be many hospitals across the world. Many of these actually in the UK look exactly like this. And it's really because spending comes in chunks of cash. When it comes along, you need to do something quickly. And not always is there a strategic plan in place that allows you to think more comprehensively about how do you connect buildings, what are the spaces between buildings, how do they work, how do people move around and connect through here. And, and as you can see, some of the buildings that um, emerged from the 1970s became a little bit confused in terms of their arrangement of space. But the view from the outside of the space, from Gregory Terrace here, you know, it's quite idyllic. You've got this beautiful view, the parkland in, in the foreground here and the Lamington Tower sitting up on the hill. So there were these intrinsic qualities within the heart of the scheme that we thought we could build upon. And these existing buildings have incredible views out. You know, so views out over towards the north, out towards Windsor and, um, and the hills beyond, and then uh, looking the other direction down towards the CPD. Fantastic, kind of in terms of their context. And you realise how close things are, you know, how you're never very far away from Brisbane CPD. So, um, we began really initially looking at the heritage core because getting the value and unlocking the value was a key portion of the bid. How could you find ways of getting uses into these buildings and understand what these buildings had to offer that really added value to the whole master plan that we're, and the ideas that we're creating? And the reason why these are important is they sit on the top of the hill. They're on the crest. So they command an important viewpoint, um, not only from within the site, but also from the site coming and the main approaches. I mean, uh, my early trips to Brisbane from the UK when I was visiting family, um, I was always new when I was coming in from the airport because the Lamington Towers on the hill was the first thing you see as you're approaching in um, from Bowen Bridge Road. And um, I mean, they are important markers and, and we felt their retention and their reuse was an essential piece of the work that we would do. So um, this gentleman here, many of you will know, hopefully, Robin Dodds, probably one of the most important <coughs> architects in Queensland um, for many generations. And he was responsible for a um, beautiful drawing, by the way. This is an architect who could still do beautiful drawings by hand. Um, this, uh, this is the Lamington E-shaped building, as we call it affectionately, which is actually nursing quarters. One of the first buildings that we started looking at on the site. And timber frame construction beautiful uh, series of buildings with two courtyards set between them, probably the most important building on the site in heritage terms. And we began trying to think of new uses for this and understanding how we'd actually repair the buildings and bring them back into use in careful consideration and um, working uh, with Jeff Cook, our heritage architect. And the buildings that also sit with these as part of the composition of the towers, which... Uh, were completed in 1935-37 by uh, Conrad Atkinson and Powell, some of uh, future part of that practice still is at the table over here. Um, and we're actually quite fans of, the, fans of these buildings, actually. You know, they're kind of robust. They have a sort of quality that alludes back to the history of the site, but very different to perhaps the foreground of these buildings sitting here amongst what is the Green Heart, which is a significant piece of open space that was still left despite all these other new 1970s buildings crept around the perimeter of the site and as a central part of the setting and components of these pieces. So the other building that we uh, also were looking at was the Lady Norman building, 
Uh, the Lady Norman is the oldest building on the site, uh, 1893. And this is one of the first children's, well, children's wards for under fives, um, which interestingly didn't actually exist until this building was created. And again, we've been looking at ways of converting this potentially to a co-working hub, also some elements of retail within this, but it's about a complete restoration of this building. Um, some very sort of strong memories and relationships back to the previous uses on this on the site. And the ward spaces, which currently look like this, which have all been partitioned up with uh, slightly insensitive services installations, will all be kind of cleared away, and then it will be restored back to uh, its original glory. As we understand, behind all those plasterboard ceilings still sits the original ribs uh, tin ceiling. And then finally, Edith Cavell, which was done by the uh, Public Works Department in 1922, and one of the older historic buildings on the site, Again, we were brought back into use, and Adam alluded to that potentially being used as student uh, residential accommodation, but also the opportunity for a crash facility on here, or sorry, kindergarten as you call it here. Um, and part of that as well is a reconsideration and the foreground of the public realm. And we've also been thinking about all the add-on buildings that often occur with historic pieces where little bits of lean-to have been added to over the years. All these will be cleaned away. This is the main approach from Bramston Terrace, which connects the the Hurston Quarter back to the existing community, and then a new piece uh, within the a, a heart of the scheme, the creation of a new urban square, the foreground to the refurbished Lamington Tower buildings, the potential option here of a new inserted piece sitting here, but the important thing is about getting ground level activity in here in terms of retail to really make this buzz and become an integral part of the Hurston Quarter. So, the ambition. So we are now very closely involved in uh, the development of the very first stages of work on the site, um, which is this building sitting, oops, again, wrong button, which is this building sitting here, uh, which we're currently developing with AU, Avanor, and uh, WAPAC. Uh, moving on to site, demolition starting in this third quarter of this year. 35,000 square meters of accommodation, and it's actually, it's a health building. And this is a piece out, um, Adam called Track, which um, Adam mentioned before. And the positioning of this piece on the site was established fairly early on in the framework of the master plan. And it was really because, one, we could actually get this piece away, because once the um, existing children's hospital is demolished, it becomes a free site. It's also very closely connected into the existing framework and infrastructure of the hospital that allows the connection into their sky bridge. Um, and also it provided a very upfront announcement that there was something happening here on the site very on, early on in the process. And an essential part of that as well is ensuring that the public realm that sits around this building that forms the edge between the building, the existing QMIR building over on this side and the heritage buildings in the Lamington Towers completes this portion here and provides the beginnings of a sort of sense of activity, very similar to what we experienced and saw through the work that had been done by Argent on King's Cross. So this looks like a very simple drawing of a demolition process, but um, the actual site rises some 25 metres from Hurston Road, which is down here, up to the Heritage Core. And of course, in most areas in Brisbane, it's uh, Brisbane Tough that sits underneath the ground, so it's pretty pretty tough stuff to get rid of and um, interesting enough though when you actually take out the existing buildings that are there although we still need to create some cutting of the rock the majority of the site in this zone is actually at the level more or less that we need it to be so it gives us a nice clean area to begin to work on this is the existing Bramston car park which later gets um, moved to uh, the other portion of the site freeing up that portion but initially we're looking at a zone that looks relatively like that and then the, the first piece of building which goes in there is the Shrek, sitting over here, which has its principal entry off from Hurston Road and uh, access into a, a series of car parking elements that are stacked into the dark portion of the site up against the existing rock face wall. And also the curation of the Spanish Steps, which is a, an inclined piece of landscaping and a series of tiered steps arrangements that bring you up from here up to the top of the heritage core itself. And you can just see in this diagram as well future proposals of how these integrate with 
potential for other hospital and the opportunity of a residential tower on the corner. And then we were very interested in the idea about how you get connections through the building. So the building itself, the shrack, becomes quite permeable. And the reason for that is that we're interested in how you create a network of routes that activates midpoints along this change in level. And that allows respites in terms of the journey, because it's some 25 metres up in the air, but also promotes activity along its edges in terms of retail uses along those prime edges. And then the next slide. And here you can see now the Shrack has moved out of the deeper plan space. And the element I just showed you on this level, and essentially there is a, a floor which has endoscopy and operating theatres which fills the entire footprint. And then sitting above that, we have two floors of inpatient wards, one of which contains a brain injury unit, and they sit in two wings of accommodation in these two zones here with a green courtyard space, which I'll come on to a little bit later, which sits in the heart of the building. So when we began our kind of thinking about the scale of these buildings and what was appropriate to the site, um, we thought something that was important was this thing that we call silhouette. And, um, and that goes back to how the current buildings read as you begin to move around the site and approach them from key positions within Brisbane. And I'm always interested in silhouette because you, know, you see the silhouette of a skyline across many cities, and actually that's what gives it its character and identity. You know? Everybody knows the skyline of Brisbane. Everybody kind of knows the skyline in New York. And when we began thinking about this, we were considering that there should be a taller building on the edge of the site that provides quite an important marker between Brampton Terrace and Hurston Road, and then a series of intermediate buildings, including the shrank, that modulates across the frontage and breaks up what is kind of the general static scale of around about 12 storeys at the moment on the Hurston Road and provides dedicated points of entry to buildings because that road frontage, for those of you who may have walked across it, it's kind of not great. There's one entry into one building. You have to walk along a little bit further into a service access. It doesn't actually encourage pedestrian movement or actually provide a proper piece of streetscape. And then sitting behind that, you get the new buildings, the hospital, as you move up the steps, and then the background to those, of course, is the Lamington Towers. And then the idea of how we move from a neighbourhood scale over on this side of the site, gradually increasing the size of our footprints of buildings, moving over to what we call our city scale as we move further eastwards. And that silhouette is kind of represented in a kind of slightly elevated view here, but it gives you a feeling of the pieces that we're looking at. And the Shrack is a relatively big footprint building because inevitably hospital buildings tend to have large footprints and it's driven by the need for operating theatres and their supporting functions which need to be on one floor. So we began to think of how we begin to articulate that and I'll come on to that in a little bit of a second but um, this, really this image here is just to show the scale and relationship of the buildings. And then the other important piece was connectivity and I mentioned about this route that we're creating which begins, I can't quite see, here we go, at Hurston, and takes you up to the top of here, but also the route that comes in this direction that connects to Bramston Terrace, that leads you over into the Hurston community over here, and this route and connection, which then takes you down to the bus station just over in that point, um, is really our two key arteries for bringing people into the scheme. And the idea of creating terraces as you move through this space that are activated by entrances into buildings and retail, and provides uh, a journey um, between these two levels that is activated by other uses, which is again an essential part of our thinking, as is the landscaping and our whole concept of a tiered garden that links you down from the green courtyards between the Lamington Towers right down to street level. And you get a feeling of the scale and change of level, as you can see in here. And also from this drawing, you can see how we utilise the back portion of the site for all our parking. So under the steps, in future phases will consist more parking. Uh, that's all concealed from view. Uh, it's effectively a landscape space on top, which means that in terms of the overall amount of space footprint that we're building on the site, you know, we're very, it's pretty low because a lot of our buildings are actually concealed in terms of car parking and the, and the support spaces for Shrek below landscape itself. So we're probably achieving in terms of open space around 50% of the site area, which is you know, pretty good. And then here, um, this is uh, one of the early views that we've been working on that shows the Spanish steps, the uh, <coughs> landscape space, the opportunity to actually and be invited into these gardens with the shade of the trees, 
uh, you can just see through here is the lift access that brings you up to this point, and then of course the flight of steps, intermediate landings connecting to these buildings, and then when you're at that point, you can either move directly into the Shrek or into the heart of the development. And the other thing that we were keen to sort of consider as well is what was the character of this place? How did it actually define a sense of being about Hurston and, and the history of Hurston? And as I mentioned, we spent a lot of time looking at the historic context and buildings, um, and we thought there were certain things that our new building should do. Um, it should have a defined base, because bases are important, that's what people engage with as they move along streets. It should have a middle section, and it should have an express top in some way. And um, we also were uh, interested in the idea of the building having some form of expression of the frame, and it shouldn't be about large expenses of glazing. It's not great in the climate less than large expense of glazing. And we were looking to modulate the facade, as all these historic buildings did, by the introduction of vertical elements and horizontal, horizontal elements by expressing the frame of the building and considering that as an integral piece of the architectural language. And you can see that from this particular image here. Um, oops, I don't see. This is the uh, colonnaded base, which provides the main sense of sense of entry and the port cochere for the building. So we're not relying on canopies. You actually come into the building. The building is the canopy. This is our um, piece that defines, effectively, our middle section from our top section. And then here we have the indented courtyard, which provides a visual amenity to some of the shared functions that sit within this portion of the building. In plan, it's relatively simple. Um, the building form is broken into a tripartite plan. We have the two elements of inpatient unit here. That is effectively the footprint that's created for the operating theatres and the endoscopy unit. And then within the middle of the scheme, we then create a densely planted courtyard garden that provides visual amenity for um, the inpatient wards and the rooms that sit on these sides. And then sitting between those, because we're keen to find as many opportunities as we could for spaces that actually could promote natural ventilation and be opened up. And of course, being hospitals, there are certain restrictions on spaces for that, but those two yellow zones are the shared lounge spaces that basically the people who are in there for in, these, in the hospital ward areas for quite a long period of time have the opportunity to actually engage with those spaces which relate back to the context of the site. They open up into the landscaping as well. And you can see through this section that very courtyard space. The courtyard also not only provides amenity within to the uh, inpatient areas at this level, but it also provides a visual connection down and, and also some of this landscaping being brought through into retail areas that sit below this, this floor as well. And you can kind of get a feel for the intense landscaping for our visual artist here, but um, the idea of really creating a very richly, densely planted courtyard um, in which provides natural shade to the rooms set around that. And then you can just see through here the lounge spaces that actually come out as a series of decks into that garden space. And the other important thing as well was just giving space to breathe for the heritage buildings. So these are the Dodds buildings that sit here with their courtyards between them. Between that and the Shrank, we have some 25 metres. And you can see that the height of our Shrank building, because a lot of it is actually using the topography of the site, is pretty consistent with the top line of the actual ridge of the Dodds buildings themselves. And of course, because of the courtyard arrangement, that portion of the building is, 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 uh, is reduced in scale to uh, the approach from that side. And we've been playing um, and then trying to find ways of actually expressing the kind of character of the site again through the landscaping. And this section shows the space between our Shrank building on the northern side and the existing heritage buildings where we're exposing the face of the existing rock and embedding planting within a series of tiered landscaping elements here activated by, re by retail and cafes at this lower level to provide a space which looks not unlike this. Again, colonnaded shaded edges provided to the northern facade, promoting activity, allowing people to move across the face of buildings. You can see here the expression, as I mentioned before, of the, the language of the building, the architecture of the, uh, the pilasters that uh, create this sort of rhythm. And then, just over on this side, you can see here the exposed rock face, giving some clues to what actually lies beneath the site, and then the Lamington building sitting over on this side here. And then, very close to closing, a couple more slides. This is really the port cochere 
entry point, and we were very keen uh, that really the arrival experience of people coming to the shrink was the best we could possibly make it. And our interior designers are working very closely with Meet and our um, health architect to realize a quality of environment here that you know, feels very different experientially when you come into the place. And you're dropped off, there's a generosity to the public spaces that you have in the lobby. And you move through very seamlessly, it's very clear, there's a logical organization. You can navigate your way around the building effortlessly. Um, and that's, again, an integral part of our thinking. And then our final image, we've got two more slides, but this is just the final image here of our Shrank building um, and its elevation uh, to the Hurston Road. And I think finally, we just wanted to sort of summarize by you know, just sort of, I guess, reinforcing why we think these schemes are important and why we wanted to come and talk to you about this today. And this is actually a view from the Lamington Towers, more or less. And, uh, you know, this is going to change. Another five years, another ten years. The skyline of the CPD is constantly evolving. But, of course, we all know there's some pretty significant schemes which are going to make a real big change to the city. And all those schemes are kind of associated leisure and tourism and retail, those sorts of things, which are great. You know, they're great for the economy, they're great for the city. Um, but it makes you realise, and it made us think, actually, that it, the city fringe, or the former things that were considered to be city fringe, sites such as the one we're working on, the RNA, they become more essential in some respects because they effectively act as the mediators between what is city scale and what is residential community scale. They are the sort of pieces that sit between the CPD and the places where people live and the communities they inhabit. And, um, and we thought that was important because this whole idea about city scale, the creation of local neighborhoods, and I, I really do like the idea of neighborhoods because Brisbane is a city, like many cities, a city of villages. You know, it's all about neighborhoods. People identify with their place. Interesting picture of the Portuguese Valley. People identify with growing up in an area, the memories that they take with them of being in a place. And we feel that that whole idea about collective memory, embracing historic context, is a really key essential of what makes great places. And we're not suggesting that everything has to be historic. You know, you, you have to create new history. But your history that you should create should be about the right sort of buildings, buildings that kind of are an extension and a natural progression of the places in which they sit, they should be good neighbours. They should actually encourage connectivity with people and activity at ground floor level through activated streetscapes, high quality buildings and public realm, and essentially just create places that people really love and enjoy. Thank you. It's a very great presentation, guys. I might invite Andrew up to uh, do the vote of thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Andrew Gettner. I'm one of the local directors at NDY here. I'd like to start by thanking you all for getting up and coming to this wonderful presentation this morning. Um, I think Kevin and um, Adam have given us a great overview of the site. Norman Disney and Young are very pleased to be the, the sponsors of this morning's event. We've been involved with many of the iconic projects around Brisbane, um, previous redevelopments on the Hurston site, so we feel a real um, connection with the site as well. Um, the, the presentation this morning has shown us um, what, what it's, it's going to be created. Uh, I think the, the Spanish Steps, uh, the creation of a place where the community can come will change the, the whole site, and I think it's a, it's a great, great way forward. So um, I'd like, to, I'm sure you'd all like to join me again for, for thanking uh, Kevin and Andrew for a wonderful presentation. It was about again, bang on time, three minutes to spare. So um, thank you all for coming along today. Our next presentation here is on the 29th of July from memory. I've left my notes behind, but... You'll get a flyer about four weeks beforehand in your inbox, so if you're um, free, it'd be great to see you come along. 
And thank you again for coming along today. Thanks, guys.